Let us sing praise to God our King, enthroned in glory above. Our defender, Lord, help us not to seek to repay evil for evil, Lord, but vengeance is yours. You are our redeemer, Lord, you have saved us from our sin, Lord, from being separated from you because of it. You are our friend, Lord, Christ calls us brethren. Lord, we thank you for the way you are intimate with us. Lord, and we acknowledge at the same time you are king. You are the ruler over all things. 
what wondrous grace it is that you would know us and make yourself known to us, Lord, and that you would bring us into fellowship with you. We thank you that you have done this. Lord, may we live obedient lives, obeying our King, that you might receive the glory you are due. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Grace and peace in Dios les Bendiga Hickman Community Church. Welcome to our online worship service again for this Sunday evening sermon. Well, we truly trust that uh, you are sheltering in the Lord during this time. Uh, it is a difficult time, and perhaps you're getting weary of it, as I am, uh, but we truly pray that this would be a time where your faith in the Lord is sustained and that your faith grows during this time as, as we wait for the Lord to, to lead us through this time of quarantine. Well, as I said, thanks for joining us for our service here as we turn to the Word of God. One of the great blessings of the Christian life outside of salvation, that is, is prayer. Prayer. Because of our faith in Christ and the fact that we've been cleansed by the blood, we've been adopted into His family, and we can address God as our Father who is in heaven. And so in prayer, we come to God and we praise Him and we confess to Him and we thank Him and we make our request to Him. What a privilege to carry, the hymn says, everything to God in prayer. So our Lord hears our prayers and He answers our prayers. But our God doesn't always answer our prayers as we think He should. Since God is our sovereign king, he reserves the right to say yes or no when he answers our prayers. Perhaps you can even look back on your life and think of a time when God said no to your prayers. And you've discovered afterwards that actually that was the best answer that he could have given you. It was sort of a, a gracious withholding of God. You didn't have the full picture. He did, and his plans were better than your petition. Sometimes God's greatest kindness is in not answering, answering our prayers exactly as we desire. But what if there was a time when you foolishly and selfishly asked something from the Lord in prayer, and God answered your prayer with a yes? And only later you recognize that what you asked for and what God gave you wasn't what you should have asked for. Now, would God do that? Well, He has. There were times in Israel's history when what God's people asked for was not something good and was not something pleasing to God. But God granted their request anyway. And so his saying yes was not a sign of his favor, but it was actually his saying yes was a sign of his discipline. Our passage in 1 Samuel chapter 8 is one of those times in Israel's history when they ask from God a sinful request, and he grants their request to them. He answers their prayer, and it's not a blessing, but it's actually out of discipline. Well, turn with me in your Bibles, please, to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 8. 1 Samuel chapter 8. We've been making our way in 1 Samuel, and now we come to chapter 8, which brings us to an important transition in the book. This chapter is a transition in the book as well as in the nation itself. Let me explain. Ver chapters 1 through 7, the focus of the story, the narrative, is Samuel. Chapters 9 through 15, the focus of the narrative is Saul. So chapter 8, then, is that transition chapter. So it's a transition for the book, but it's also a transition for the nation, the history of the nation. Chapters 1 through 7, God's people are led by judges. Eli was a judge. Samuel is a judge. But in chapters 9 and following, God's people are led through kings. So again, that leaves chapter 8 as that transition chapter, that important link. 
Remember Israel at this time. Uh, they're one nation. They're not two. They haven't split yet, but they're just sort of a loose group of associated tribes, if you will. There's no central worship location. There's no temple. There's no Jerusalem uh, that they have. Uh, Sa- Solomon and David, they aren't household names because there's no kingship. And God rules his people through a mediator, a prophet and a judge named Samuel. Now, you probably need a good reminder, what is a judge here? Now, we usually think of a judge in a courtroom and whatnot, but a judge at this time was one who led the nation and gave spiritual direction to the nation. Yes, he settled legal disputes and that sort of thing, but he gave counsel for living under God's rule. That was a judge, and Samuel was the judge at this time. Well, as we look at the text in 1 Samuel 8, we will see that the nation makes a major mistake. I was reminded this week of 1 Corinthians 10, 6, that talks about the Old Testament and the purpose of the Old Testament. And it says in, in 1 Corinthians 10, 6, it says, now these things happened as examples for us. So when you come to the Old Testament, there are many purposes for the Old Testament, but understand that part of it is an example for us. The verse goes on to say that it's an example for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. So the Old Testament is written for our instruction that these people are examples for us. And so when we look at this chapter today and we see the mistakes that they make, we need to be mindful that we can make the same exact mistakes as they do in relation to our God. So with that in mind, I want to look at this chapter and notice uh, their mistakes, but also ask three questions. So our points will be in the form of questions. The first question is, are we depending on God? Or are we seeking a substitute? The second question we'll look at is, are we living distinct or are we seeking to be similar? Similar to the world around us. And then the third question that we'll ask in looking at this text is, are we devoted to His wisdom or are we following our own sense? That is, our own sense of things. So three questions that we need to ask ourselves. Number one, are we depending on God or seeking a substitute? Well, our story takes place some years after that great revival at Mizpah that we saw in chapter 7, and Samuel is now in the twilight years of his ministry as prophet and judge. And the elders of Israel approach Samuel with a demand. They say, appoint for us a king. You can look at their reasons there. If you look at chapter 8, verse 5, they say to him, that's Samuel, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge, to judge us like all the nations. So they want a king, and they give some reasons for that. And the first one is Samuel's growing old. We get that. It's true. That's what it says in verse 1. He was old, and so a transition of leadership is coming. Well, what Samuel did was he delegated some of his leadership to his sons. They're named Joel and Abijah. But his sons were no better than Eli's sons. Remember Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas? They were scoundrels. And so these two men were judging down in Beersheba, which is about 50 miles south of Samuel's home in Ramah. And they exploited the people just like Hophni and Phinehas did. They took bribes and they perverted justice. The people know that and they don't want to be stuck with these guys. So the solution then, of course, to Samuel getting old and his scoundrel sons is give us a king. We want a new form of government, a monarchy. Give us a king who it says there will judge us. And then it says like all the nations. Now, at the outset, there's an appearance of wisdom here. The old ways passing, we don't want the evil guys. Give us a king here. There's new leadership that is needed. Well, Samuel hears this plan, and he doesn't like it. If you notice in verse 6 of chapter 8, it says, But the thing was displeasing, displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. So Samuel hears this request, and the text literally says the matter was evil in Samuel's eyes. 
So thankfully, he doesn't lash out at the people right there. But if you notice at the end of verse 6, it says, and Samuel prayed to the Lord. So he hears this request. He knows that it's evil. And wisely and humbly, he prays. Isn't that what James 1, 5 tells us? If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives to all without finding fault. Samuel needs to know what to do here. So it says he goes to the Lord and he prays. He wants the Lord's wisdom. He wants the Lord to weigh in before he takes action. Well, we haven't understood yet why this is something that Samuel would have thought of as evil. And so we should see what the Lord has to say about this. What's the Lord going to do here? It says in verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people. Wait a minute. Listen, the Lord says, you heard what they said, give them a king. Give them what they want. It says there in verse 7, listen to the voice of the people in regard to all that they say to you. And then here's the reason that the Lord sees. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. The people here, are rejecting their God and seeking a substitute for him. If you look down at verse 20, it gives us a little more explanation here. They say they want a king over them, and verse 20 says that we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us, and then here's this, and go out before us and fight our battles. So there's military protection that they have in mind. And if you were to peek ahead at 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 12, Samuel reveals that it was when the king of the Ammonites came out against them that they said, a king shall reign over us. So the people here are asking for a king because they are showing that they are rejecting God as their king and showing that they want a military leader that will give them security. This is really surprising because we just saw in chapter 7 that the Lord defeated the Philistines. He thundered and defeated the Philistines for them. But But here they are rejecting their Lord, and they want a king. Now, we've talked about this before, but let me answer this question again. Was their request for a king wrong? Was it wrong for them to ask for a king? Well, the answer is complicated because it's both yes It was wrong, but also, no, it wasn't wrong. Let me remind you and and help you see this. So first of all, the request was wrong because God is their king. God is the king of the universe. It says since Psalm 29, 10, he's been enthroned as king from before the flood. That's from all eternity. And when when they came out of Egypt... God proved that he was supremely king after this victory over the Egyptian armies. In fact, it says in Exodus 15, 3, it says the Lord is a warrior. And then in 15, 18, it says the Lord will reign forever and ever. His kingship is by his nature, not the fact that he attained it or gained it by defeating some other false god. He showed he is king over all by defeating uh, uh, the Egyptians and any God that they trusted in. So to, re- to ask for king is a rejection of God, but at the same time, it's not wrong because God set a precedent that there would be a king in Israel. In fact, you remember 1 Samuel chapter 2 and Hannah's prayer? She was praying after she dedicated or after she was given a, a son in Samuel, and it says in verse 10, She says, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and will exalt the horn of his anointed. So there was an expectation of a king. God would one day give them a king. If you look back at Genesis, Genesis 17, 6, the Lord says, Abraham, kings are gonna come from you. In Genesis 49, 8 through 10, uh, Jacob prophesies to his sons and he says to Judah, Your father's sons will bow down to you, and the scepter shall not depart from your house. And Moses indicates in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 20, that the time would come 
when Israel would want a king. And so Moses writes to them to make sure that Israel would not have a king like all the nations, that he'd be different. He'd be a man after God's own choosing. He would, be, uh, he would not have a military machine, multiple wives, or massive wealth. Instead, he would submit himself to the Lord's law. In fact, this king would copy for, write a copy of the law for himself. So, in asking themselves for a king, the problem is not with the royal office per se. The problem is the people intend to switch their reliance and allegiance from the divine king to a human king. So it was not the fact of their request for a king, but it was the motive of their request for a king. And God says, they're not rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me from being king over them. Remember in chapter 4, when they were losing and they lost to the Philistines, they lost in battle, and they said, we need to get the ark. They're manipulating God. But now here in chapter 8, they are trying to find a substitute for God. Look at verse 8 of of chapter 8. The Lord recounts, he says, Like all the deeds which they have done since the day that I brought them up from Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing to you also. So the Lord's saying, since the day I brought them up, they've been doing this to me. They've been rejecting me all this time. This is simply the latest incident of it. After the Red Sea, there was the golden calf incident. There's the whole book of Judges rejection. In chapter 7, they had repented uh, after worshiping Baal and the Ashtaroth. Years later, during the exile, this is after this, in Jeremiah 2.13, he says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. This is simply the current rejection of Israel's own Redeemer. So the Lord says, they're not rejecting you, they are rejecting me. In a sense, they are rejecting Samuel because God is, excuse me, Samuel is the God-appointed leader of Israel, just like Moses was and Joshua was. He was the human leader, but God says, okay, They're throwing you off because they want a king, but they're not really rejecting you. They're rejecting me. This is about me. So the Lord's response in verse 9, again, he says, now then, listen to their voice. Listen to their voice. So they have another military problem. The king of the Ammonites is coming, and they say, okay, um, we need a king to judge us and to go out before us and fight our battles. What are they looking for? a substitute. They're not looking for their king and their God. And God is saying, they've rejected me. They've rejected my power. They've rejected my laws. I have set the terms of the covenant. The terms of the covenant are obedience and faithfulness to me, but they have rejected those terms. They want a prosperity that will cost them nothing. They want to they fashion a leader after their own image. So God says, you know what you need to do? Samuel, listen to them. Here's that example that I mentioned to you where they are getting what they wanted from the Lord, but it wasn't something that they should have asked for. The Lord has a history of granting sinful requests. In the wilderness in Numbers 11, when they craved meat, God says, I'll give you meat. And he gave them meat. And while it was still between their teeth, he sent a plague over them. God was granting their request, and it wasn't a good thing. So they were, they were substituting, they wanted a substitute for the Lord, they weren't depending upon the Lord. So we look at this and we see an example for us to follow, not follow, I should say. So let me ask you, do you depend upon the Lord for your security? Or I should ask you, what are you trusting in for your help? Now we have a lot of different useful, we should say, securities in our lives. We have locks for our cars. We have alarms for our houses. We have insurance for our property and our person. We have, we have our health and our strength. We have savings accounts. Those are useful. But friend, they must never be a substitute for God. We must always depend upon the Lord for our security. 
Moth and rust will destroy, and even despite locks, thieves will break in and steal. So we can't depend upon locks for our security. We can't depend on our our health or our strength for our security. I think the coronavirus has really put that out of mind. We we can't guarantee that we'll have health and that we'll have strength. Do we really think that a mask is going to protect us from this virus? Sure, wear the mask, but where is your true hope and your true security? It needs to be in the Lord. In fact, the Bible says it's the Lord who kills and the Lord who makes alive. A savings account, a bank account, that won't save you. We've seen in 1929 when the stock market crashed, $14 billion was lost in one day. And I was reading a headline from February that said global stock markets have lost $6 trillion in value in six days. All of the prosperity that was gained under the years of Trump's presidency thus far have vanished. So you're learning, if you haven't already seen, you cannot put your security in that money. As Proverbs 23, 5 says, it makes itself wings and it flies away. We can't trust in those things. We can't have security in those things. We can't put our hope in politicians. We can't put our hope in men. Psalm 118, verses 8 through 9 says, It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. So my point to you, friend, is where are you finding your security? And is your security in the Lord your God, who is your King? What is truly your only hope in life and in death? Are you looking for substitutes to provide you with security? Or are you just saying, Lord, you're everything to me. And I trust trust in you. I look to your word. I look to your promises. Jeremiah 17, verses 7 and 8 say, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose trust is the Lord. For he will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and will not fear when the heat comes, but its leaves will be green and it will not be anxious in a year of drought nor cease to yield fruit. Is the Lord your trust? Israel was seeking a substitute and not depending upon God. May we not seek a substitute, especially during this time where it's really shown and it's really revealed what our trust is truly is. Well, there's a second question to ask, and it's this. Are we living distinct or are we seeking to be similar? Are we living distinct? Are we, are we separating ourselves from the, the surrounding culture around us, or are we simply blending in? Remember, God's people said, we want a king just like the other nations. They're saying, we want to fit in. We want to belong. We want to be like others. After all, this is a new era This is the Iron Age. We need to get with the times. They said it in verse 5, and they say it in verse 20 as well, that we may be like all the nations. Well, God's purpose for them was not to be like all the nations. God's purpose for His nation that He redeemed out of slavery was to be distinct and unique amongst them the nations. His expectation was that they come out and be separate. And so when his people request a king, it's not only a rejection of God, it's also a rejection of their calling. Israel's calling was to be the Lord's treasured possession among all peoples, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. They were to be holy to the Lord, separated from the peoples, Leviticus 20, 26. They were to be recognized as a great nation, a wise and understanding people, Deuteronomy 4, 6. Set high above all nations for praise, fame, and honor above all nations, Deuteronomy 26, 19. And also in 1 Samuel 12, 22, a people for himself. But instead of being that holy, great nation, They said, we want to conform to the practices of the surrounding nations. We want to reject the Lord's authority and be just like them. And unfortunately, this is just the latest example 
of that in their life. They don't want to be distinct. They want to be similar. Samuel gives the list of what it will be cost, what it will cost to have a king. He does that in verses 11 through 18 or 10 through 18. And they say, no, verse 19, but there shall be a king over us. There shall be a king. The people are obstinate. They've hardened their heart just like Pharaoh hardened his heart before Moses. They're like that baby who knows nothing, knows nothing that is good for them, yet screams and cries out and demands for their own way. Or the nation's like that rebellious teenager that says, I must have the latest and greatest clothes or gadgets or privileges or freedoms just like my friends in school. I want that. Give it to me. The people say, no, Samuel, we will be like the nations. And really, you need to make it happen. Well, friends, what about us? What's the Lord's calling and expectation on his church? Well, he hasn't changed his standards for the New Testament saints. He expects his church to be distinct from the surrounding peoples. The church's calling is to be the Lord's chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 1 Peter 2, 9 says. That's distinct. Romans 12, 1 and 2 urges us by the mercies of God to offer our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice to sep- acceptable to God and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That is distinct. 1 Thessalonians 4, 4, and 5 say that each of you know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. You are to be distinct. Ephesians 5, 4 calls us out and says there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. That is distinct. And he says in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance, but be like the Holy One who called you. Be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. That is distinct. The Old Testament nation was to be distinct, but they wanted to be similar to the fallen world and the ungodly people around them. And that's the same calling on us, New Testament saints. So dear Christian, let me ask you, are you distinct? Do you stand out? Do you find that perhaps you have the same goals as the world? Or do you see that you have the same affections as the surrounding culture, that you have the same objectives and the same priorities as those around you? Or perhaps you find that this temptation is great to avoid being different and distinct. Why would that be such a hard temptation? Where is the gain in being like the world? There is no gain. Remember your calling, O Christian. It is to come out and it is to be separate. The wise father of Proverbs 3 One and two says, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. He says, remember what you heard and obey those commandments. And I know as sinners, we think commandments and statutes and laws are so so cramping on us and so binding on us. We want to be free from those. But verse two says, for length of days and years of life and peace, they will add to you. Do you want peace? then obey the word of God is what he's saying. That's where the good is found. That's where the true joy is found. A Puritan by the name of Samuel Rutherford wrote a letter to a friend. And he says, oh, how heavenly a thing it is to be dead and dumb and deaf to this world's sweet music. If you and I are dead and deaf, 
to the siren song of the world. We will not want to be like the world. If our hearts are tuned to Him, we will sing His grace. Israel didn't want to be distinct. Do you want to be distinct? Dear friend, you're called to be a stranger and an alien and an exile. Be distinct. Be distinct in your choices, in your spending, in your leisure, in your priorities, in your hope. As Jesus told the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2, 5, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Be distinct for your Lord and your King. There's a third question we must ask ourselves based on what we see here and the mistakes that they made, and it's this. Are we devoted to God's wisdom or following our own sense? Look back at verse 9. The Lord says, Now then, listen to their, to their voice. However, you shall solemnly warn them and tell them of the procedure of the king who will reign over them. So the Lord counseled Samuel, listen to them, but then he says, I want you to tell the people about what having a king is going to mean for them. What will be the impact on them? And so he's received that, and then starting in verse 10, Samuel gives a, sort of a, a manual of the king's rights. This is what to expect if you have a king. And if you notice there in verse 11, he said, this will be the procedure of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and place them for himself in his chariots. Look at verse 13. He says, he will also take your daughters for perfumers and cooks and bakers. Look at verse 14. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards. Look at verse 15. He will take a tenth of your seed and your vineyards. Look at verse 16. He will also take your male servants and your female servants. Look at verse 17. He will take a tenth of your flocks. And then finally, here's the climax. And you yourselves will become his servants. We can summarize what Samuel said by take, 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 take. This is what it's going to mean. This is a government, remember? This is not simply a new guy with a new title. This is a government, and it has structure, and it needs to have servants, and they need to be fed, and they need land, and they need taxes or tithes to be paid. And so you say you want a king, Samuel says. Well, here's what it's going to mean, and it will feel like an oppressive control upon you. And this is all going to amount to you reducing, being reduced to a slave. As it says in 17, you yourselves will become his servants. That's what it means. And then he says in verse 18, then you will cry out. You will cry out in that day because of your king. Israel's been crying out a lot but it's been because of the enemy. Now he says, you will cry out because of your king. And then he says, because of your king, whom, notice this, you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. Ouch. This is what it's going to mean, and this is what's going to happen after that. And after you cry out, the Lord will not answer. It says in Jeremiah 32, 33, the Lord says, they have turned their back to me and not their face. Turn their back and not their face. The Lord's response in Jeremiah 18, 17, he says, like an east wind, I will scatter them before the enemy and I will show them my back and not my face. That's terrifying. But the Lord says, this is gonna come and you're gonna cry out, but I am not going to answer you in that day. So the people hear this, and it says in verse 19, nevertheless, nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And he said, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. 
So they reject God's wisdom through Samuel and decide to follow their own sense. We will have our king to judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They've heard the wisdom of the Lord, but they won't allow God's words to bring them back from their foolish plan. They say, this is what we want, and you should give it to us. And he's going to fight our battles, our king. Man. The only battles that I want to fight are the Lord's battles. And if it's the Lord's battle, he's going to fight it. The people say, we want a king. He'll fight our battles. Friend, this example should caution us. They heard the word of the Lord, but they don't submit to it. He gives his instruction, but they're not teachable. They're wise in their own eyes. Are you wise in your own eyes? Are you teachable? Do you listen to the word of the Lord? Proverbs 3, 7 says, do not be wise in your own eyes. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Israel was a people who, like any other people, according to Deuteronomy 4.33, heard the voice of God speaking from the midst of the fire and survived. They were given his statutes and his judgments. They were taught in the wilderness. That verse you know well, that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. And yet, they don't want God's wisdom. They felt they were sensible. They were savvy. They wanted to be sophisticated. They had their own sense about things. Who needs God's wisdom? Well, again, this is an example to us that we should not crave evil as they craved. So how about us? How about you? Do you have a soft heart when it comes to to the scriptures? Do you have a teachable spirit when it comes to God's word? Do you recognize that you don't live by bread alone, but as Christ Jesus did when he was here on earth, by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God? Dear friend, we have a king right now. We have a king. It's Christ Jesus. He is our king. Do we listen to him? He is the sole head of his church. He is the chief shepherd. He has placed us as pastors and elders under him, but he is the great king. We listen to him. So let me ask you, do you listen to his wisdom? Do you listen to his wisdom when it it comes to God's plan for gender, for male and female, that there there are only two and they never change? Do you listen to God's wisdom when it comes to gender roles? First in the home, that for you, man, husband, you are to lead your wife and love your wife. Do you give up your life for your wife? And your leadership should look like a loving, humble headship. And wives, do you believe and submit to God's wisdom, which says submit to your husband with joyful, intelligent submission? Parents, do we submit to God's wisdom that says that children are disciplined and must be disciplined either by reproof or by the rod? Do we listen to his wisdom in the church that he does not call for women to be pastors but men only? Do we listen to his wisdom for the church that we are to practice church discipline, that we are to be faithful to his word, that we are not to have worship services that are a place of entertainment, where we tickle the ears of the masses, but where we faithfully proclaim what he has said. Dear friend, would you say that you listen to God's wisdom and you submit yourself to to it? I love the example of Samuel here. His life was characterized by an eagerness to seek out and to listen to God's word. Is that what your life is characterized by? An eagerness eagerness to go to God's word, to seek it out, to understand what it says, and then to practice it. Israel was not devoted to God's wisdom. They followed their own sense. How about you? 
Well, Samuel took the words of the people when they said again, no, we want a king. He takes it to the Lord in verse 21. After Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the Lord's hearing. Verse 22, the Lord said to Samuel, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. The Lord says, we'll give them what they want. And then it says at the end of of the verse, so Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Samuel sends them to their homes. And the chapter is over. So the drama, as it were, of this chapter is is at a point of tension where we're asking, okay, what is going to happen next? That's the beauty of Scripture. We're going to have to find out next time when we look at chapter 9. But I want us to recognize that chapter 8 has been a sad commentary on God's people, hasn't it? They've ignored God's revelation. They've rejected His authority and they've conformed their thinking to the world around them. They said, give us a king. So it's a sad commentary, but it's also a sober commentary. It's a sober commentary on God and how he determines his answer for his purposes to our prayers. Is that not sobering? So this passage is an example to us, and it reminds us how easy it is for us to find a substitute for God that will provide the protection we think that we need. It's tempting for us, is it not, to want to blend into the the world around us, the, the culture. And it's easy for us, is it not, to trust in our own sense of things and not in God's Word. Well, may we heed... Their examples, so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. And may God truly enable you and I to live ever more dependent upon Him, increasingly distinct from this world, and continually devoted to His great wisdom for our lives, and then find the blessing and not the discipline when God answers our prayers. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father in heaven, how we need you. How we long for your protection. How we long for your will in our lives. I pray, oh God, that that you would bless us at this time, particularly at this time of of quarantine where this virus is, is ravaging our world. I pray that you would protect us, Father. I pray that you would heal those who are afflicted with this disease. And I pray that you would bring mercy out of this situation, not not judgment from this, O Lord. I pray that as we've looked at the example of the people in chapter 8 here, Lord, I pray that for us, our prayers and our desires would reflect a heart that depends upon you and you alone for our security, not those other things that you've allowed and even provided I pray that that you would enable us to have a a greater distinction from this world, and and especially in this time, to to show and, and, and reveal a hope and a gladness even and a peace even in the midst of this time. And I pray that we would be more and more submitted and devoted to your word and that that would be experienced by us the joy of obedience. And you, O Father, would see these things and be blessed. We need your help in all these things. So grant us your mercy now, we beg of you. Through Christ, amen.